Lesson 8 Covenant Law Sabbath Afternoon May 15 We are called to be holy, and we should carefully avoid giving the impression that it is of little consequence whether or not we retain the peculiar features of our faith. Upon us rests the solemn obligation of taking a more decided stand for truth and righteousness than we have taken in the past. The line of demarcation between those who keep the commandments of God and those who do not is to be revealed with unmistakable clearness. We are conscientiously to honor God, diligently using every means of keeping in covenant relation with Him, that we may receive His blessings, the blessings so essential for a people who are to be so severely tried. Putting our trust in God, we are to move steadily forward, doing His work with unselfishness and humble dependence upon Him, committing ourselves and our present and future to His wise providence, holding the beginning of our confidence firm unto the end, remembering that it is not because of our worthiness that we receive the blessings of heaven, but because of the worthiness of Christ, and our acceptance through faith in Him, of God's abounding grace. Our High Calling, page 344. Those who take Christ at His word and surrender their souls to His keeping, their lives to His ordering, will find peace and quietude. Nothing of the world can make them sad when Jesus makes them glad by His presence. In perfect acquiescence, there is perfect rest. The Lord says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. Our lives may seem a tangle, but as we commit ourselves to the wise master worker, he will bring out the pattern of life and character that will be to his own glory. And that character which expresses the glory, character, of Christ will be received into the paradise of God. A renovated race shall walk with him in white, for they are worthy. The Desire of Ages, page 331. Righteousness is holiness, likeness to God, and God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. It is conformity to the law of God, for all thy commandments are righteousness. Psalm 119, verse 172, and love is the fulfilling of the law. Romans chapter 13, verse 10. Righteousness is love, and love is the light and the life of God. The righteousness of God is embodied in Christ. We receive righteousness by receiving Him. Not by painful struggles or wearisome toil, not by gift or sacrifice, is righteousness obtained but it is freely given to every soul who hungers and thirsts to receive it. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat, without money and without price. Their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord, and this is his name whereby he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 1 chapter 54, verse 17, and Jeremiah, chapter 23, verse 6. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 18. Sunday, May 16. The Election of Israel. The Lord gave special direction to Israel to keep themselves distinct from idolaters. They were not to intermarry with the heathen, nor form any confederacy with them. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 to 8. Selected Messages, Book 2, pages 121 and 122. It is impossible to enumerate the advantages the Lord prepared for the world in making the Jewish nation the repository of his rich treasures of knowledge. They were the subjects of his special favor. 
As a people who knew and worshipped the true God, they were to communicate the principles of his kingdom. They were instructed by the Lord. He withheld from them nothing favorable to the formation of characters which would make them fit representatives of his kingdom. Their feasts, the Passover, the Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles, and the ceremonies attending these gatherings were to proclaim the truths that God had entrusted to his people. At these gatherings, the people were to show gladness and joy, expressing their thanksgiving for their privileges and the gracious treatment of their Lord. Thus they were to show to a world that knew not God that the Lord does not forsake those who trust in him. The history of the children of Israel is written for our admonition and instruction upon whom the ends of the world are come. Those who would stand firm in the faith in these last days and finally gain an entrance into the heavenly Canaan must listen to the words of warning spoken by Jesus Christ to the Israelites. These lessons were given to the church in the wilderness to be studied and heeded by God's people throughout their generations forever. The experience of the people of God in the wilderness will be the experience of His people in this age. Truth is a safeguard in all time to those who will hold fast the faith once delivered to the saints. The Upward Look, page 232. It is through the sanctification of the Spirit and the belief of the truth that we become laborers together with God. God waits for the cooperation of His Church. The object of all this provision of heaven is before us, the souls for whom Christ died, and it depends upon us to lay hold of the promises God has given and become laborers together with Him, for divine and human agencies must cooperate in this work. Fundamentals of Christian Education Page 188. Monday, May 17. Ties That Bind. Jehovah revealed himself not alone in the awful majesty of the judge and lawgiver, but as the compassionate guardian of his people. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He whom they had already known as their guide and deliverer, who had brought them forth from Egypt, making a way for them through the sea, and overthrowing Pharaoh and his hosts, who had thus shown himself to be above all the gods of Egypt, he it was who now spoke his law. The law was not spoken at this time exclusively for the benefit of the Hebrews. God honored them by making them the guardians and keepers of his law, but it was to be held as a sacred trust for the whole world. The precepts of the Decalogue are adapted to all mankind, and they were given for the instruction and government of all. Ten precepts, brief, comprehensive, and authoritative, cover the duty of man to God and to his fellow man, and all based upon the great fundamental principle of love. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Luke chapter 10, verse 27. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 305. Let it be made plain that the way of God's commandments is the way of life. God has established the laws of nature, but his laws are not arbitrary exactions. Every thou shalt not, whether in physical or in moral law, implies a promise. If we obey it, blessing will attend our steps. God never forces us to do right, but he seeks to save us from the evil and lead us to the good. Let attention be called to the laws that were taught to Israel. God gave them definite instruction in regard to their habits of life. He made known to them the laws relating to both physical and spiritual well-being, and on condition of obedience, he assured them, the Lord will take away from thee all sickness. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 15. Set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 46 and Proverbs chapter 4, verse 22. The Ministry of Healing, page 114. So ready 
So eager is the Savior's heart to welcome us as members of the family of God that in the very first words we are to use in approaching God, he places the assurance of our divine relationship. Our Father. We are bound to the Lord by the strongest ties, and the manifestation of our Father's love should call forth the most filial affection and the most ardent gratitude. The laws of God have their foundation in the most immutable rectitude and are so framed that they will promote the happiness of those who keep them. Sons and Daughters of God, page 267 Tuesday, May 18 Law Within the Covenant What said God to Abraham? I know him said the heart-searching God, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. Abraham would cultivate home religion, and the fear of the Lord would lead to integrity of life. He who blesses the habitation of the righteous says, I know him, that he will command. There is no betraying of sacred trusts, no hesitating between right and wrong. The Holy One has given rules for the guidance of all, the standard of character from which none can swerve and be guiltless. God's will is to be diligently and conscientiously studied, and it must be made paramount in all the affairs of life. The laws which every human agent is to obey flow from the heart of infinite love. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 216. Moses, who understood the character and value of the law of God, assured the people that no other nation had such wise, righteous, and merciful rules as had been given to the Hebrews. Behold, he said, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Moses called their attention to the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, and he challenged the Hebrew host, What nation is there so great? who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great, that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day? Today the challenge to Israel might be repeated. The laws which God gave his ancient people were wiser, better, and more humane than those of the most civilized nations of the earth. The laws of the nations bear marks of the infirmities and passions of the unrenewed heart, but God's law bears the stamp of the divine. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 464 and 465. Divine grace never leads away from mercy and the love of God. It is the power of Satan that does this. When Christ preached, his message was like a sharp, two-edged sword piercing the consciences of men and revealing their inmost thoughts. The work that Christ did, his faithful messengers will have to do. In simplicity, purity, and the strictest integrity, they are to preach the word. Those who labor in word or doctrine are to be faithful to their charge. They are to watch for souls as they that must give an account. Never are they to clothe a thus saith the Lord with enticing words of man's wisdom. Thus they destroy its living energy, making it weak and powerless so that it fails to convict of sin. Every word spoken by the direction of the Holy Spirit will be full of the deepest solicitude for the salvation of souls. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 158. Wednesday. May 19. The Stability of God's Law Jehovah engraved his Ten Commandments on tables of stone that all the inhabitants of earth might understand his eternal, unchangeable character. 
Those who desire to advance in learning and proficiency need to lay hold of these wonderful revelations of God. But it is only as heart and mind are brought into harmony with God that they will understand the divine requirements. None need concern themselves about those things which the Lord has not revealed to us. In these days, speculation will abound, but God declares, The secret things belong unto the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. The voice that spoke to Israel from Sinai is speaking in these last days to men and women, saying, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. The law of God was written with his own finger on tables of stone, thus showing that it could never be changed or abrogated. It is to be preserved through the eternal ages, immutable as the principles of his government. Men have set their will against the will of God, but this cannot silence his words of wisdom and command, though they may set their speculative theories in opposition to the teachings of revelation and exalt human wisdom above a plain, thus saith the Lord. Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students, page 248. Through Jesus, God's mercy was manifested to men, but mercy does not set aside justice. The law reveals the attributes of God's character, and not a jot or tittle of it could be changed to meet man in his fallen condition. God did not change his law, but he sacrificed himself in Christ for man's redemption. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. The law requires righteousness, a righteous life, a perfect character, and this man has not to give. He cannot meet the claims of God's holy law. But Christ, coming to the earth as man, lived a holy life and developed a perfect character. These he offers as a free gift to all who will receive them. His life stands for the life of men. Thus they have remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. More than this, Christ imbues men with the attributes of God. He builds up the human character after the similitude of the divine character, a goodly fabric of spiritual strength and beauty. Thus the very righteousness of the law is fulfilled in the believer in Christ. God can be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Romans chapter 3 verse 26. The Desire of Ages, page 762. Behold the world today in open rebellion against God. Many do not hesitate to sneer at the word of God. Those who believe that word just as it reads are held up to ridicule. There is a growing contempt for law and order, directly traceable to a violation of the plain commands of Jehovah. Violence and crime are the result of turning aside from the path of obedience. Behold the wretchedness and misery of multitudes who worship at the shrine of idols and who seek in vain for happiness and peace. Prophets and Kings, page 185 Thursday May 20. If. There is divine grace for all who will accept it, yet there is something for us to do. There is a work for us to do to fit ourselves for the society of angels. We must be like Jesus, free from the defilement of sin. He was all that he requires us to be. He was a perfect pattern for childhood, for youth, for manhood. We must study the pattern more closely. We have a work to do to fashion the character after the divine model. All wrong habits must be given up. The impure must become pure in heart. The selfish man must put away his selfishness. The proud man must get rid of his pride. The self-sufficient man must overcome his self-confidence and realize that he is nothing without Christ. That I may know him. Page 300. God desires us to reach the standard of perfection made possible for us by the gift of Christ. He calls upon us to make our choice on the right side, to connect with heavenly agencies, to adopt principles that will restore in us the divine image. 
In his written word and in the great book of nature, he has revealed the principles of life. It is our work to obtain a knowledge of these principles and by obedience to cooperate with him in restoring health to the body as well as to the soul. Men need to learn that the blessings of obedience in their fullness can be theirs only as they receive the grace of Christ. It is his grace that gives man power to obey the laws of God. It is this that enables him to break the bondage of evil habit. This is the only power that can make him and keep him steadfast in the right path. The Ministry of Healing, pages 114 and 115. The condition of eternal life is now just what it always has been, just what it was in paradise before the fall of our first parents. Perfect obedience to the law of God. Perfect righteousness. If eternal life were granted on any condition short of this, then the happiness of the whole universe would be imperiled. The way would be opened for sin, with all its train of woe and misery, to be immortalized. Christ does not lessen the claims of the law. In unmistakable language, he presents obedience to it as the condition of eternal life, the same condition that was required of Adam before his fall. The requirement under the covenant of grace is just as broad as the requirement made in Eden, harmony with God's law, which is holy, just, and good. The standard of character presented in the Old Testament is the same that is presented in the New Testament. This standard is not one to which we cannot attain. In every command or injunction that God gives, there is a promise, the most positive, underlying the command. God has made provision that we may become like unto Him, and He will accomplish this for all who do not interpose a perverse will and thus frustrate His grace. God's Amazing Grace, page 134. For further reading, The Faith I Live By, Faithful and True, page 42, and Patriarchs and Prophets, The Law and the Covenants, pages 363 to 373.